Okay, convex optimization is a super cool topic. I'm excited to talk about this today. Okay, so let's say we want to solve the following optimization problem. It's called opt. We want to minimize a function f of x, which is differentiable and convex, um, subject to a whole pile of constraints, actually two piles of constraints. The first pile of constraints are the g constraints, where the g's are um, not, the g's have to be less than or equal to zero, and g is differentiable and convex. Each, G, each one of the G's is differentiable and convex. And then the H's are all affine. Okay, so what does that mean? What do all these terms mean? Well, convex is where a convex function is where you can place two people on the function and they can, no matter where you place them on the function, they can see each other without the function getting in the way. Okay, so, um, so there's no, you know, the function doesn't sort of loop around so that it interferes with the with the sight these two people have on each other. So you can think about like, you know, one 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 guy sort of standing on the line looking looking for his friends and he's like, hey dude, I can't see you. There's part of the functions in the way. It's some obstacle or something like that. And then the other guy's saying, hey, that's because the function's not convex. Okay, but um, if the function is convex, then no matter where these two people stand on the function, um, there's a line connecting them uh, that doesn't intersect the function. Okay, so that's convex. Affine just means linear. Um, I'm not sure why it's called affine, but uh, the way I think about it is um, affine, it's fine if you're on a line. Uh, now for these affine constraints, um, the, the, you have to be on the line and you actually, you know, it's like you, you sort of, you know, vanish off the end of a cliff or something if you, if you fall off that line. Okay, so um, a function is concave if its negation is convex. So you wanna think of a concave function as an upside down convex function, okay? And affine functions are, both, are considered to be both concave and convex, right? You flip them upside down, you get the same thing. Um, you put two people on the line, the line doesn't interfere with, the, with their side of each other. Okay, so you can think of like a nice happy convex function and then Concave functions may be not so happy. All right, so I'm gonna rewrite the OPT problem, but this time I'm gonna put the constraints in the objective, okay? So it's, a, it's, it's going to be an equivalent optimization problem. It's just that the constraints are in, actually inside the objective. So we're gonna call it theta p, or, or it's, it's also gonna be called the primal objective. So the primal objective equals f of x, which was the thing we actually want to minimize, plus infinity times one if any of the g constraints are violated, and then plus infinity if any of the h constraints are violated. So if any of the g or h constraints are violated, this thing is infinity. So when you minimize it, you're going to not get infinity, and you're going to give, it's going to give you the minimum value of f of x for which all of these constraints, all the H constraints, all the G constraints are obeyed. Okay, so, so hopefully you agree with me that this formulation of the problem is the same as, uh, the, 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 that the problem is the same as on the previous slide, even though we formulated it slightly differently. Now, this objective function, it's not differentiable. It's not even continuous. And so we might consider trying to replace these functions that are infinity sometimes and zero other times uh, with, um, with something nicer, okay? With something nicer. And it's, I, know, I know this sounds strange, but we're gonna replace these functions by a line. And a line seems like a dumb choice, but hopefully you'll agree with me later that it actually was a very good choice. Okay, so let's think about um, lower bounding these functions again, that are infinity sometimes and zero other times by a line. Okay, now right here, I, I'm just working on the G constraints for now. So for the G constraints, if they're satisfied, the function is zero, okay? The G constraints are satisfied when um, G is less than or equal to zero, okay? So I have less than or equal to zero over here uh, when, when, so I'm, I'm calling it U, so U is actually G of X, right? When it's less than or equal to zero, then the value of that function is zero. And when u is positive, that function is infinite. It's infinite 
all, you know, the whole area there is infinite. And I'm going to lower bound this function by a line. And that line has slope alpha. Now it's very, very important that alpha has a, a non-negative slope because you see if it had a negative slope, then it, it, would, uh, it would actually violate, it wouldn't be a lower bound, it wouldn't be a viable lower bound. So throughout all of these lectures, I'm gonna say over and over again, alpha is alpha, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. And now you know why, it's because this line is not a viable lower bound if alpha is negative. Okay, so let's work on the, the age constraints now. So remember for the age constraints, h has to equal zero. So this function is, this is a function that is infinite except at the point zero. So it's infinite everywhere except at zero at that point. So to lower bound that by a line, as long as that line intersects at zero, as long as it intersects that point zero, we're good. And it doesn't matter whether the slope is positive or negative, either way it's totally fine and it's still a valid lower bound for this function because the function again is infinite everywhere except at the point zero. Okay, so when we do that, what we have is a lower bound and that lower bound is called the Lagrangian. So I've taken every one of those G constraints and replaced it with alpha G and taken all of these H constraints and replaced it with beta H. And here again, the only thing I have to make sure is that alpha is greater than or equal to zero. Beta can be whatever it wants. Okay, good. So now we've established that um, the Lagrangian is a lower bound for the, the primal objective theta P. The primal variables are called X. The dual variables are called alpha and beta. Now, as it turns out, which is really interesting, the maximum of the Lagrangian with respect to alpha and beta is actually equal to the primal theta P. I know it's, it seems so strange, right? Um, why would this be true? But as it turns out, there are settings for alpha and beta. There are choices for alpha and beta you can make that will force the, um, the, um, the maximum of the Lagrangian to be equal to uh, the, the primal theta P. And I'll show you how that works in the next video. Thanks.